So I met Bruce back in 2006. It was the last job interview I ever had, and I, I guarantee it was the most interesting job interview I ever had. Uh, Bruce is a really interesting guy. Uh, when I was asked to do this, I was excited. I thought of a way to explain like the last 20 years of my experience with Bruce. It's kind of difficult. Bruce is very special. He's unique. And uh, to try to summarize it is, is difficult. There's a lot of parts and pieces to Bruce that shouldn't fit together, but do. <laughs> so I'm an engineer nerd. So the best way I could think to explain Bruce is to come up with a Venn diagram. And with this, the first section is IQ. So Bruce is probably the smartest person I know. Um, we'll get into discussions about concrete. And we'll often be into it, and I'll say scaling. And uh, he'll say, don't you remember power study from back in 1955? And I'm like, yeah, Bruce, my brain doesn't think that way. So he pulls up all these things in his head, and he just spills out things amazing. Uh, Bruce is a PhD. He can become an expert in a week, uh, weekend. I've seen him take books and articles and come up to speed extremely quickly. So Bruce is highly, highly intelligent. Uh, Bruce has a fantastic work ethic. Um, his dad was a, a concrete contractor. I think he's very passionate about what he does. He works hard for ASCC. He's been a member of TAC, a professor. He's given a lot of time to the industry. So Bruce is an extremely hard worker. Bruce is a freaking good time, too. If you've been out with Bruce on the side, you know that Bruce is a fantastic, uh, he's, he's, he's fun. I mean, he climbs, <laughs> he climbs uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. He names his dog, Dog. Um, I've been out to the local Mexican restaurant in Boulder with him. And uh, when you have a margarita on the menu named after <laughs> yourself, you know you're a good time. <laughs> and last but not least, the man has a f affinity for the Hawaiian shirts. So when we look at the Venn diagram, we have all these bubbles. And I think these interactions kind of is the best way to explain Bruce. So with the first one, we'll see what we get when you combine a good work ethic with a freaking good time and Hawaiian shirts. So <laughs> we get Magnum, PhD. There's no uh, forensic study, big or too small for Magnum, PhD. <laughs> he will solve it in style. When we look at IQ and work ethic, Bruce has been a lot of things. He's been an engineer. He's had his own test lab. Um, he uh, has done a lot of interesting jobs. And I think one thing, one aspect of Bruce is he's also almost a psychologist. So when he answers the hotline for ASCC, he has to deal with not only you know, solving the problem, but it's almost helping them through it. Because sometimes the answer that you get isn't always the answer you want. And even outside of work, uh, Bruce has helped me on the personal side. So he, his strategy with concrete is fantastic, but his life strategies are also equally amazing. So I think the psychologist Bruce is pretty impressive too. When it comes to IQ and uh, a good time, that's the part to me that is unusual. So Bruce is so smart. Generally, when you're that intelligent, you kind of don't have the personality to go with it. So <laughs> Bruce, Bruce combines those very, very well. And then when we look at the Hawaiian shirts and a freaking good time, I don't know what Bruce is going to do in his retirement, but I think party boat captain would be a fantastic option. And <laughs> Bruce excels at everything he does. And I think he'd be a damn good party boat captain. It's kind of hard to include everyone, too. And I know Ward can't be here, but Ward was sleeping on the upper deck. <laughs> and uh, nice to have him. And all that, we get Bruce. Uh, so with the boring stuff, I'm going to talk about lightweight delaminations. We see this too often, and it's usually the same things that cause lightweight delaminations. Uh, when they happen, they can be pretty extensive. And it's usually either due to trapped bleed water and that can be from finishing a slab a little too early. It can also be, we think, sometimes it's crusting. So when you have a high rise that's way up in the air and you're on the 10th, 20th, 30th floor and the wind's whipping through, uh, it's possible that the surface of the slab can stiffen up and crust a little bit. And then when the bleed water is trying to come out, it gets stuck beneath the surface. And finishing air and train concrete is obviously a no-no. What ACI would say is 3% air is the max. With lightweight, we usually see air and train concrete because air usually makes things lighter. It's the lightest thing in concrete. 
So a lot of times we'll see mixed designs with 6% plus or minus a couple, and that's too much. So anything above 3%, we've seen delaminations at 3%. Uh, they're not as bad as you know, what you get with higher air contents. But with lightweight, when there is a problem, sometimes we see really high air contents. So to identify delaminations, it usually happens when you find out you have a problem. And I, I guarantee there's a lot of slabs out there that nobody's checked and they have delaminations, but it's usually because somebody drops something on the, on the floor, they hear a hollow sound, and then you start looking around and you find out you have a major problem. So chain drag, there's an ASTM for it. Um, we usually use procedure B. It, uh, it's really simple. You think, you know, with all the technology we have, that um, a chain drag is so simple, but it's super effective. So if you've ever done it, you run a chain over the surface, and when you hit a delaminated area, it's super loud and it sounds hollow. So it's really effective. I take my chain drag very seriously. I, I train for chain drags, and I like to use big chains because I can find and remove the delamination in one shot. Uh, when it comes to investigating delaminations, one mistake that we see a lot is when you core the slab and you go through a delamination, what happens is when you just pass a delaminated section, the core spins in place, so you're grinding the top of the, you know, where the delamination is in the core barrel, and you destroy the surface you're looking at. So what we do is we make some vertical cuts in the slab, and we, you know, make an octagon, we make a section of uh, slab that's isolated and smaller than the core barrel, and then we core down over it, and that, and we epoxy it. So we epoxy it together, core down over it, and that keeps the core slurry from getting between the interface. And then when it when gets to the lab, it's it's preserved and it's in you know it's in its natural form. So lightweight's kind of interesting because in normal weight concrete, when we get a delamination, it's usually pretty thin, sixteenth of an inch, eighth of an inch. It's rarely much thicker than that. But when it comes to lightweight, what we find interesting is that. Delaminations are often much more than an eighth of an inch. We get three eighths of an inch, half inch. We've seen up to an inch in delaminated, delamination thickness. Delaminations can be from air, like I explained. Sometimes we see high, high air contents, um, and that's just a mistake. Usually that's caught by testing. But one thing that's interesting, sometimes we'll get on jobs where the air has been measured and it's five or 6% going into the pump. And then when it gets through the pump, or there's a problem we don't know about it, we think everything's fine. Um, when we take a core, we find out that we've seen up to 14, 15% air, which seems insane. Uh, it doesn't always happen. But one of the problems going through a pump is that you pressurize the concrete. And if you have an unsaturated aggregate that's full of voids, when the water is getting forced in through the pump, all the bubbles are coming out. So what you would measure in a rollometer that may be 6%, if you take into account all the air that was in the aggregate and can get forced out through the pump, it could be very high. This is an example of a Petro where it was on air and train concrete, but looking at it um, in the delaminated core, we see a lot of entrapped voids. So you don't get the nice spherical round voids. We get uh, more entrapped air that was forced out of the aggregates. When it comes to bleed water, this is a test where we just tried to pull the surface off to see what kind of strength we would get, because sometimes it's hard to remove a delamination. And uh, with this, you can see the, the white area in the middle. So here we got bleed water trapped under the surface, and the bleed water was trapped, and that's what was causing the hollow sound here. Removing delaminations. So when it comes to repair, um, I've seen people try to use chipping guns, bush hammers, and sometimes a little bit lightweight because the delamination is so thick it's hard to remove. Uh, we found out the best way is to almost score the surface or use a, a shaver. So with this, you set the blades a little distance apart. So you can set the blades a half an inch apart and an inch apart. And when you run over the delam, sometimes it'll come up just by itself. And then if you score it like this, it comes up very easily. So you get a flat blade chipping hammer, and it will cruise right through that. It's the fastest way we've found to get through removing VLAMs. Uh, we have, because of silica hazards and dust removal, 
Um, we've seen contractors come up with interesting ways to control that. So uh, this contractor built a little chamber for himself. So it had dust removal, kept everyone around them safe. Same project, they just used a tent. Uh, sometimes in delaminations, because of bleed water, you get latents at the surface. So right under the delam, uh, water can get trapped. So you remove the delamination, and then uh, the surface isn't always great to bond to. So sometimes, even after you remove the delamination, you might have to do a little surface prep to clean up the base slab so that you can bond to it. So just an example of miscellaneous areas where we identified delaminations and had to remove them. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're almost an entire room. And this is a case where it was 12% air, so you're going to get massive delaminations with that much air. So the end result, if you use the cut and chip method, you tend to get a good CSP too. So this is a great bonding surface. Once you remove the weak concrete and you prep it this way, it's really good for adding um, DLAMs. So then when you want to check your bond strength to get your best lab tech, and uh, you start doing bond pulls. You can make mock-ups, so don't go full scale, like don't fill in a whole room. If you do small mock-ups, three by three, four by four areas work the best. And when you do a bond pull, you core down through your topping into the base slab and um, you pull up on it and you're basically looking to see where it fails. Does it fail on the substrate? Does it fail at the interface where you're trying to bond it? Uh, and the strength really matters. So. In ACI, the best value that we could find is 175 PSI. So if you get a bond strength of 170 PSI, 175 PSI, it generally means it's monolithic. It doesn't mean that a strength less than that won't work. It's just um, probably the best defendable value that you can find in ACI. Uh, just an example of a bond pull where it failed on the substrate. So I burned through that pretty quickly, but that's my light, light delamination talk. I'm trying to speed things up a little bit.